some people say, well, yeah, I don't really want to be vocal. I don't want to get out there. I'm not, I don't feel comfortable creating stuff and, you know, putting, I just want people to find me. Well, yeah, there are some situations where that's enough, but in most situations it's not. And so you can choose that either the marketplace is going to decide what you're all about, or you can influence that decision by actually putting stuff out there and helping the market to see what you want them to focus on. Hello and welcome to Pillars of Wealth Creation, where we talk about creating financial success with a special focus on business and real estate. I'm your host, Todd Dexheimer. Now, let's get to it. Hey, our sponsor for the show today is Pine Financial Group, the leader in hard money lending in Colorado and Minnesota. And they were recently approved to offer their investment publicly. This investment offers only for investors in Colorado and Minnesota and is only made through their investment prospects. Get your copy today. Simply visit www.pineinvestments.com and click to get started. Look, there's a reason why some of the wealthiest people in history invest in loans backed by real estate. Learn more about the risks and returns at www.pineinvestments.com. Hello and welcome back to Pillars of Wealth Creation. I'm your host, Todd Dexheimer. Today, I have Michael Zapersky with me. Michael, how are you doing today? I'm great. How are you doing, Todd? I am doing fantastic. So a little bit about uh, Michael. He's an author, entrepreneur, and CEO of ConsultingSuccess.com, where he runs a seven-figure consulting business as he travels the world with his family. That sounds fun. He has consulted for organizations and advised leaders on every continent except Antarctica and in over 30 industries from service providers to billion-dollar multinational corporations. Michael's helped over 300 consultants add six and seven figures to their annual revenue. Michael's an in-demand speaker and gives keynotes and workshops for the Certified Management Consultants Association, Canadian Internet Marketing Conference, and Chartered Management Institute UK and, and uh, many others. So Michael, with that said, why don't you give our listeners a little bit about uh, your background and what did I just say? What's it all about? Yeah, definitely. I mean, you did a great job there, so I don't have too much more to add. But uh, if we go back in time, I started my first consulting business uh, transitioning into university with my cousin and business partner, Sam, who uh, to this day continues to be my business partner. Uh, and of course, my cousin as well. So we've, uh, we've built, we've sold uh, multiple companies over the last 19 years. Uh, and I really got into consulting, you know, without planning to get into consulting. I didn't go into one of the large consulting organizations. We just, we started a web design development company. Uh, Sam did a lot more of the design and, and the branding side and the technical side at that time. Uh, and I was really doing a lot more client management and, and marketing and ideas. We didn't really know what we were doing. You know, this was way back in the day, kind of early internet days, but that led from one business to the next. And then we started a, a marketing and uh, branding consultancy where we were really advising organizations. And so again, my role was on, on the marketing side and that kind of theme continued to, to play out as we built different businesses, work with um, all kinds of organizations, as you mentioned, from startups, small shops, all the way to multi-billion dollar organizations. I uh, ended up actually going over to Japan and opening up a branch office for one of our companies there uh, and had just a you know, fantastic time, great opportunity to work with some very large Japanese kind of multinationals. Uh, and then, when I transitioned back to North America after five, six years in Japan, Sam and I were at that point working on different businesses. And we said, you know what, let's do something together again. But like this time, let's actually do something online because we both really enjoyed travel. We like to, you know, see different cultures and learn languages and all that kind of stuff. So we wanted a business that would really would allow us to, to work from anywhere. And so that's how ConsultingSuccess.com got started. Uh, but in the early days, we didn't really have, it wasn't a business. There was no monetization plan. It was just a bunch of articles and content where I was sharing what I was learning, kind of, you know, stories from the front lines, the successes, uh, the best practices, but also the failures, right? The real challenges, the, the points of learning uh, with the goal of, hey, if we put out enough stuff, you know, in, into the marketplace, hopefully it's going to help some people and maybe something will come of that. And what we found is that people just, they, they wanted more. They found it to be helpful. And so that led to, creating our first course for consultants and then later creating a coaching program for consultants. And now, you know, we're, uh, we're 10 years in uh, to consulting success and um, it's a blast. So you're consulting consultants. You got it. Perfect. I like it. Um, 
So who, who's a good consultant? Like, uh, how, how do you, uh, how do you determine, like, does it work for me? Am I, should I be a consultant? Well, yeah, the number one thing is to have expertise, right? So there's, I mean, I think actually we should make an important distinction because these days a lot of people talk or they use the word consultant, um, but it, it, it can have different meanings to different people, right? Um, some people use the word consultant, but really what they are is a coach. Uh, other people use the word consultant, but they're really they're an in-house contractor or they have one client and they're spending all their time working on one big project. Uh, when, when we talk about consultants, uh, really in the clients that we work with, they're people who they might uh, just be transitioning from the corporate world into consulting, or they might right now be working with just one client and their kind of their income is roller coaster up and down between engagements. But really what they want to do is they want to build a business. Uh, they want to you know, make the shift from being a quote unquote consultant or contractor to actually becoming a consulting business owner um, where they have a pipeline that is thriving with new opportunities at all times where they can create real freedom. But in order to, to achieve that, you have to be able to actually provide a real result to the end client. So the number one thing, the most important thing is that you have expertise. And that's what most of the, the, you know, the clients or all the clients we work with, they have the expertise. So it's not their skill or the expertise that's the issue. It's the business side. It's, you know, winning proposals and how do you actually identify your ideal client and develop messaging that will get their attention and have marketing that will, you know, build a pipeline and start to generate leads. Hmm. So, what uh so so to explain the difference between a coach uh and a consultant and a co or coaches yeah so versus a consultant sure i mean the the first thing is these days people say the word consultant but when right. you look at what they're doing they're um they're working with consumers so in our world at consulting success we only work with consultants who are serving other organizations that might be a for-profit or a non-profit but let's say um you know you are uh some people would say a massage therapist, they would somehow lump that into consulting or a life coach or um, you know, an addictions specialist. So yes, these people could be considered to be consultants because they're providing advice and, and helping and making an impact and that's all good. But in the world that we focus on, a consultant is someone that's going into an organization, again, could be small, could be large, uh, could be for, uh, for profit or nonprofit. And what they're helping to do is to provide expertise to solve problems or to help the, that client to see results faster than they otherwise would if they're trying to figure things out themselves. So they're not necessarily going in and doing all the work. They're not um, actually, you know, pushing all of the buttons, but they're going to, they know through their expertise, what bus, what buttons need to be pushed and they can help the client to see or to identify which are the, the best buttons to push and in what order and how that will provide the, the best result in the shortest period of time possible. Cool. Cool. So, um, I think a lot of these key factors between uh, a lot of my listeners, who a lot of them are real estate investors or, or business owners. Um, they, we're looking to always expand and grow our business, right? Everybody wants to continue to grow, continue to be profitable. What are some key factors that you see with the clients that you work with f that people do for greater expansion? What are, what are some of the factors? Yeah. So, I mean, one very big one is um, rather than addition. So a lot of people look to try and add things to grow. They think I need more products, more services, more this, that, and the other. Uh, but if you really look at the most successful companies out there, uh, they tend to grow through subtraction, meaning that they have a simple business model. Uh, they, they're not trying to be all things to all people. They get very, very focused at being exceptional and mastering one area before they really move on to something else. And that's what holds a lot of people back, especially at the early stages, even if you've been in our world and consulting for some time, but maybe you haven't been marketing your business. Well, you might come into it and think, uh, I've heard that I should be doing webinars and Instagram and LinkedIn and you know all these different things, Facebook ads. And so people are trying to master all these things because they think that doing more of it is going to actually work. But in fact, trying to, to learn all those things uh, is what's going to hold you back from making real progress. So the key thing is to get very clear on what is the most direct path to achieving what you want and then removing all the things that aren't really adding significant value so that you can really focus your time, your energy, uh, your learning on the things that have the, the greatest and highest potential. And then directly connected to that as well, Todd, is uh, action taking. So, you know, the mindset around the things need to just be perfect and I have to know everything. Uh, that's what holds a lot of people back from, from taking action. 
And so the, you know, if you, again, identify and kind of analyze the most successful people who have really accomplished a lot in whatever field they're in, they typically aren't trying to learn everything that exists under the sun before taking action. Like if, if we talk about, you know, investing in real estate, there's a lot of different laws out there. There's a lot of different, you know, codes and there's different situations. And if someone tried to learn all that stuff before actually going out and trying to find their first deal, right, they would never get that first deal done. And so I think even in real estate investing, and I have some experience in that, in that area, certainly not as much as you, I'm sure. But, um, you know, if I tried to learn everything, like I would never have made that first deal. And then I wouldn't learn because when you make that first deal, then you learn what you don't know and you learn what's actually necessary and what isn't. And so that's what, where you get the real momentum, right? So it's that action taking that is so critical, not trying to learn everything before you take action. Yeah, very good. And, and I really like a couple of things you said there, really narrowing, basically narrowing your niche or, or making sure you're cutting out some of those extra things. And then you talk about uh, how a lot of people want to do the Facebook and the Instagram and the LinkedIn and the, all this kind of stuff. And how do you decide what's right? Like what, there's so many things out there. There's so many ways to uh, reach people and everybody's got their own opinion of what's the best. How do you That's decide right. what's the best for you? And, and maybe you have your own opinion on, on what's the best. Yeah. Number one, don't listen to just what other people are, are saying. Um, what I've found and I, what I see and kind of observe in the marketplace is typically someone will say, you should be doing Instagram ads. Well, that's because they're selling you know, a program on Instagram or that's like what works for them, but it doesn't mean that's what's right for you. So there's two key components to this. Number one, what is the best way to reach your ideal clients? An example would be, let's say you're targeting 85 year old uh, women. Well, you're probably not going to want to use webinars to target them. Like it's just not going to be the best way to communicate effectively with them. So figure out where do your ideal clients go to consume information and what's the most direct path that you can get in front of them. For some people that might be Facebook ads for other people, that's going to be LinkedIn, um, you know, organic video posts for other people. It's going to be to, uh, to show up at networking or, or trader conference types of events. So figure out what is the most direct and the fastest kind of most efficient path to get directly in front of your ideal clients. Then the second thing is play to your skill set, right? Don't try and uh, kind of compromise or, or don't try and play to your weaknesses, right? Really focus on your strengths. So if you absolutely hate video, just because other people are using video, then don't try and get good at video because it's not what you like, but maybe you enjoy doing a podcast and you're great at interviewing and asking questions, or maybe you're, uh, you're really good at illustration and you can somehow use that illustration to illustrate ideas and that's what you post, or maybe you're really good at writing, so that's what you lean into, right? So find, lean into your strengths, don't try and compensate for, for the weaknesses. You put those two things together and typically you're gonna have a good match. Hmm. Yeah, a lot, of, a lot of good points there, and I think that's really important to play to your strengths. I mean, a lot of people, are out there giving advice and the advice is not necessarily on, you know, what's, as you have already said, uh, it's not necessarily what's best for you just because somebody that has Instagram is the way to go. It doesn't mean, you know, if you're marketing, like you said, to the 85 year old, uh, uh, you know, retired women's group, they're not on Instagram. Right. Uh, they're not hanging out there. Uh, but then a lot of people, the same thing, will say, well, you got to, you got to start a podcast. You've got to do YouTube videos. You've got to do Facebook live. You got to do this and that. And it's like, well, that might not be the best solution. If, if you're not good at podcasts, maybe you're not good at that, but maybe you're really good at writing blogs. Um, you know, then the blogs are going to be the better way to go. Uh, the books and, and that type of thing. But podcast might not be the way to go. Uh, same thing with video and all that kind of stuff. So you just want me one other point there. Uh, if I can jump in Todd to, to share just for, um, for the benefit of everyone, you know, like right now what we're talking about is, is content, right? So we're talking about podcasts or we're talking about ads. We're, we're talking about uh, things that maybe aren't the most direct way to get in front of, of your ideal clients. Yeah. Um, so this is, uh, I think a big area that a lot of people have trouble with or, or just are led to kind of astray these days they're told you need to put out content and listen, content is important, but content marketing takes time. And yeah. so if you only focus on writing, if you only focus on podcasts, if you only focus on videos, you know, all these other things, it's not that it can't work. It most likely will. And it'll pay dividends because oftentimes it's evergreen. So you'll continue to get benefits from that long term. But 
there's a much faster path. It's called just identifying who your ideal client is and going out and connecting with them. So you can do that through LinkedIn. You can do that through picking up the phone and giving them a call. You can do that through sending them a letter and following up. There's many things that you can do that to get actually in front of an ideal client like today or tomorrow. You don't have to wait uh, weeks or potentially months or even years. I mean, I've seen some studies that say that content marketing can take up to 18 months to really kick in. Uh, it's important to plant those seeds, but they're not going to not going to necessarily, you know, give you the fruit that you're hoping for right away. And so you have to compensate by leaning into the direct outreach and actually going, you know, to get in front of your ideal clients now. And that's uncomfortable and hard for a lot of people. But if you're really committed to being successful, then you got to put in that work at the early stages. So give me an example, um, you know, of one of your clients, um, you know, that uh, is is looking to connect and how would they go about how would they go about finding that group? How do, how do they go about finding and connecting with that group? Because we can all we can all identify potentially groups, but then how do we actually connect with them to be able to convert them into our clients? Yeah, that's a great question, and it's going to depend again on who your ideal client is. So mm -hmm. I'll offer an example in a business context, but keep in mind that. For some people, that that might be different. So, just quickly, yeah. if let's say you're targeting a certain type of, of investor or a certain type of consumer, you know, you might find that Facebook is really good for you, or you might find actually purchasing or acquiring some kind of list that gives you information about you know investments that someone has made before. That might be a better place to go to. But I'll talk about kind of what we look at in our world because uh, if you're looking to to connect with and sell to other business owners or uh, executives in organizations, then LinkedIn is a really good place to do that. And if you use Sales Navigator, which is uh, kind of a premium paid service on LinkedIn, you can get very, very specific about who you want to target. You can, for example, say, I want to connect with CFOs at biotechnology companies that have between 50 and 500 uh, people that are based in Ohio and that have gone to these schools. And so now you can very quickly, like literally in an, in an instant, you can see who those people are. You can see which companies they're in and you can now connect with them. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, you mentioned kind of like transactions before as being a mistake. And I agree with that, that this is a problem that a lot of people make when they use LinkedIn or other platforms is they treat these interactions as transactions instead of thinking about them as relationships. But if you reach out to someone uh, and you're looking to build a relationship, you're not trying to just transact instantly, then you make a little comment. You can say something that's going to get them to want to uh, accept that connection request. And even if they don't accept it, uh, there's other ways that you can still follow up through LinkedIn or picking up the phone or sending emails. There's lots of other tools that can help you to, to get that contact information. But like that, you know, today, right now, you can jump on, you can send a connection request to someone. They can accept it right away and boom, you're starting a dialogue, right? Now it's all about having that conversation, finding ways to add value, finding ways to follow up, making sure that they understand and know what it is that you do, but not in a salesy, pushy uh, manner, rather just one where it's low key and now they know and that then leads to conversations, especially as you're providing value. And you do that consistently with enough people and you start to build a really robust pipeline that means that you're not um, you know, in a position where just you're like relying on one client. You have enough opportunities that you're always in control of your business because there's plenty of leads uh, flowing through your pipeline at any given time. Very good. Very good. I like it. Um, it's simple, but it works. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's definitely simple. And I think a lot of people don't do the simple thing because uh, it just seems like we need to be doing everything like you. Well, yeah. And, and people to. Exactly. And like with technology, everyone expects that they're going to get instant results, right? Instant gratification. They're looking for, and uh, they have the belief that somehow using some kind of technology is going to make the process more efficient and more effective. Uh, but in most cases, it takes time to learn those things and to master them. And it may not be the right fit. So just sticking to the foundation, the fundamentals uh, is uh, in most, in most situations, a better place to build. And then from there, you can figure out how to optimize and fine tune. Hey, let's take a minute to thank our sponsor, Pine Financial Group. Look, you work hard for your money. Is your money working hard for you? Because of inflation, money sitting idle erodes your wealth. Many investors understand that real estate is a great investment, but may not want the effort or the risk that comes with owning their own property. They want to sit back and have payments, hit their bank account each and every month. Stop eroding your wealth and start building it by asking your money to work for you. You should be earning profits while you sleep in investment backed by real estate. 
Pine Financial Group, the leader in hard money lending in Colorado and Minnesota, was recently approved to offer their investment publicly. This investment offers only for investors in Colorado and Minnesota and is only made through the investment prospectus. Get your copy today. Simply visit www.pineinvestments.com and click to get started. There's a reason why some of the wealthiest people in history invest in loans backed by real estate. Learn more about the risks and returns at www.pineinvestments.com. It's www.pineinvestments.com. I want to invite you to join us at the North Star Real Estate Conference. This conference is September 20 and 21st in Minneapolis, and it's going to be packed full of a ton of great speakers. We've got uh, just a, a great group of people speaking. You can look at our lineup on our website, nreconference.com, and sign up there as well. We've got an early bird special. All you need to do is type in early bird, one word, and and uh, you can get $100 off. And that's good through August 10th. So make sure you sign up now. Take action. Look, people that take action and value their education are those who are going to succeed. I know there's a lot of free content. My podcast is free. There's all kinds of free content out there, and maybe even free meetups that you're attending. But this conference is going to blow your socks off. This is going to be well worth the price and all the profits go to charity so it's definitely time to take action sign up now don't delay because the prices will go up um, but you know what every time i attend a conference i 10x actually i would say i'm more like a thousand x even my investment, a hundred, a thousand, potentially even more X my investment. I've met so many fantastic people. I've met investors at conferences. I've met potential partners at conference. I've joined mastermind groups because of conferences. So it's a ton of value. You cannot replace it. So check it out. NREconference.com. Thanks a lot. So Michael, uh, I want to shift to some mistakes that you either see your clients making or maybe even some mistakes that you've made. Um, and you know, how, how have you kind of, let's say it's you, how have you learned from it and improved upon it? What, what can you part give of our listeners, you know, about mistakes that you're seeing being made? Yeah. Are you wondering about the consulting business specifically or just more generally or? It, yeah, it, it doesn't that's, matter. That's a big topic because I've certainly made a lot of mistakes, Todd. <laughs> Let, let's, talk, let's talk about you then. Let's focus on you. What are some mistakes? What are, what's one big mistake maybe that you've made and how have you learned from it? How can you teach our audience uh, about ways to avoid mistakes that you've made? Yeah, definitely. Uh, so one, this is, uh, you know, I made this in the early days and uh, I've seen many other consultants make it. Uh, but I think it also applies beyond the world of consulting and, and it's back to, you know, really understanding who your ideal client is. Uh, in the early stages, it's very easy for people to say, yeah, I'll work with all kinds of different people. Uh, and even you end up taking on some business that probably like, you know, deep down inside, you know, wasn't really right for you, but you wanted the cash. You were looking, thinking kind of more short term than long term. But as time goes on, what you start to, to realize is that you only have so many hours in a day. And even though you should not be using hourly billing, uh, but even, you know, you just still have 24 hours in a day. And so as your calendar fills up and as your, um, you know, your company fills up, then every, uh, you know, kind of project or every hour that, that you or your team spends working with a lower value client means that you don't have that space to accept a higher value client. So it's really important that you qualify and kind of disqualify uh, those that aren't a good fit as well as those that are a good fit and more, you know, more and more focus on the ideal client. As you do that, what you'll start to find is you're able to attract more of those ideal clients. Like I was speaking with one of our clients just last week who decided to make a transition from focusing, you know, partly on large and partly on small clients to focusing only on large organizations because we ran the profitability around it. They got very clear that, yeah, this is what much more profitable. It's going to bring in more, more revenue 
I can see this. It's also just takes less time to, to service the larger client. So they've made that shift. And literally within the next two days, they had two of those larger kind of ideal clients reach out to them. Um, mm -hmm. You call that whatever you want, right? But it's, it, there's something about getting very clear about who your ideal client is because your messaging gets sharper. Uh, you start to see those, you know, those opportunities, um, you know, kind of more abundantly because your mind is focused on them. You also feel uh, more energized, more focused, uh, lighter because you're not trying to balance all these different types of people that you could, you could uh, work with and all the different types of offerings that you need to, to provide these different types of people. You can get very clear on exactly who you're serving, how you're helping them, and then make sure that you're resonating with them in terms of your messaging. Yeah, definitely. Um, I want to go back a little bit to kind of the marketing thing. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of consultants out there. There's a lot, I, I do some, I do some, uh, coaching, um, in real estate, which is different than consulting, of course, but I do some coaching in real estate with some, with some investors. I also take in, in investors that want to invest privately, passively in my investments. And it's a crowded industry. It's a crowded field. Um, in the, in the multifamily field, um, in the coaching field, and I'm sure in the consulting industry, how do you, how do you market on, how do you stand apart in a crowded kind of industry crowded field? So one way to do that is again, by getting very, very focused on who you're serving. Uh, as an example, if you're at a level where you're saying I'm a marketing consultant or I'm a business coach or I'm a real estate coach. Well, now the competition is very high because there's a lot of people that could fit into that bucket. And there's right. a lot of people who, who just simply identify themselves in that exact same way. So there's no real differentiation. So you end up becoming a commodity. But if you take that a level deeper and you say, okay, I'm a real estate coach, but I work only with um, high net worth individuals, or I work only with, let's say, only with uh, physicians and doctors, and I invest only into uh, office, you know, kind of commercial buildings. Well, now the pool of experts in that area has become much smaller because there's probably not many, you know, experts that focus only on working with doctors and that invest into uh, commercial and office buildings. So when your ideal client, the doctor is thinking, well, yeah, I have some extra money. I want to invest it. And your name comes up. The first thing that they think is, oh, well, this person really understands me because they only work with people like me. So now you've created differentiation. You're not a commodity anymore. And now you take that a level deeper and it's, you only focus on one kind of asset class or one type of real estate that says and send, sends a signal, oh, this person's a real expert in this one area. So one way to do this is to just go deeper and deeper and deeper into a specific area and become known as the expert in that area. It doesn't mean that you're the only person doing that because if you are the only person doing it, it probably means it's not very profitable because I'm sure others have tried it before. But um, you know, globally, there's not a problem at all if there's others that are doing what you're doing. That's competition yeah. is healthy. There's, there's yeah. no one out there that can work and service the whole market anyways. But the second thing to layer on top of that is to start to demonstrate your expertise, to communicate value. And you can do that in numerous different ways from speaking to writing to podcasts to videos, uh, right? But it's all about being able to demonstrate your expertise. Uh, some people say, well, yeah, I don't really want to be vocal. I don't want to get out there. I'm not, I don't feel comfortable creating stuff and, you know, putting, I just want people to find me. Well, yeah, there are some situations where that's enough, but in most situations it's not. And so you can choose that either the marketplace is going to decide what you're all about or you can influence that decision by actually putting stuff out there and helping the market to see what you want them to focus on. And so if you put out back to our example that you work with doctors in you know, commercial real estate uh, investments, well, now you can start to put out content just about that. And so when doctors are searching online about uh, investment opportunities for doctors, real estate, you know, investment opportunities for doctors, who's going to come up, right? Most often it's going to be you because your content is tailored specifically to them. And so this is a, another area that's really important that if you're putting out content or you're just you know, trying to uh, communicate val greater value and expertise, the more focused you are, uh, the more you're going to cut through the clutter and you're going to stand out. A good example, we had a client in Northern California and he transitioned from being an executive at a, at a national organization to consulting. Uh, he started off calling himself a leadership consultant. There's a lot of leadership consultants. So when he was writing about leadership, he was competing with like Harvard Business Review and Forbes and all these other um, you know, organizations that 
have a lot more history that Google likes a lot more than they like him because they're established. Uh, and so there's no chance for his content to be found. But as he decided to narrow in the focus to really look at, well, where do I have the most uh, experience and expertise? His content, his strategy, his messaging followed that. And now he's, you know, he's known um, nationally, maybe even internationally, but nationally he's known. He's on all kinds of panels. He's speaking. People see him as a real authority and expert because he's been become visible. He's standing out from the crowd. He's not just another leadership consultant. Yeah, I, a real key there. Stand out from the crowd and, and make sure you're getting, you're narrowing it down. And how do we um, navigate that and, and not alienate maybe some of our current uh, clients? Or for in my instance, you know, I've got I've got my investor list, and I've got investors that are uh, doctors and lawyers and uh, you know uh, engineers and all all kinds of different industries how do i not alienate them yet create a niche around let's call it uh doctors to go with your, your sure show? yeah my example and again i have no um experience in in that area yeah uh, specifically I'm not, I'm not a doctor this is not <laughs> or legal or any other, other kind of advice i'm just kind of sharing my experiences here but um you know so the first thing would be to to say that there's no one right model uh okay. You can find plenty of people who, uh, let's say, if we're using with kind of the, the real estate side, who work with all different kinds of investors from different backgrounds, and they're very successful. Uh, but in that case, what, they're, what they've most likely done is focused on, for example, one specific type of asset class, uh, one specific geographic or a few specific geographic areas, and they yeah. built up their expertise and knowledge there. So that's their way of kind of niching down and getting very, very focused. Uh, but for someone who, let's say, is working with um, just different types of clients, and they've recognized that they see greater potential and opportunity in with one type of ideal client, then what they can start doing is just continue to serve and, um, and add value for the existing clients, but slowly transition in terms of new clients and new business and new outreach to focus on that, that new area. And then as you start getting those new opportunities coming in, you can start to see and make decisions. Do I want to keep my old clients as well? Do I want to maybe say to my clients, Hey, because you know maybe they're not as profitable or you don't enjoy it as much or it's just your focus is kind of being spread and you feel spread thin, you can have that conversation. Say, you know, I'm making the shift and uh, I can, I'd can. i love to refer you to somebody else who can help you. Or you might decide just to keep them within your fold and kind of, you know, quote unquote, grandfather them in to what you're doing. And there's there's a lot of different ways to, to approach this. It's kind of on a case-by-case situation. But even, just because you're uh, your current situation might be different from what your future kind of desired state is. It doesn't mean that you have to stay there, right? You're in the present. Don't live in the past. Um, so wherever you want to go, decide where that is and then start taking actions towards it. Definitely. Well, Michael, you, you've provided some fantastic advice so far. Uh, we've got a couple more questions uh, before we wrap up the show, but before we do those last couple questions, I just want to ask if you've got any other advice you want to leave with our uh, listeners. Um, on what topic specifically? <laughs> <laughs> uh, just on, on creating and building a business and, and what you see successful people doing. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, one thing like you and I just talked a little bit before um, hitting the record button there, Todd, uh, I, I, I'm a big believer that, businesses, you know, having a business is the best way to create wealth overall. Um, but at the same time, to really create wealth that, um, that goes beyond what you're currently doing, it's, it's important to, uh, you know, take a percentage of what you're earning and then put it into other investments. And so that's what, what I've been doing for years. And I found it to be a very successful uh, kind of approach and strategy. So, you know, there's nothing out there that I've ever found that can create the kind of uh, income and wealth that my company creates. But then when I have that, I'm not just going to keep everything in the company. I'm going to look at other investments because then I can get other experts to manage that money or to do something with it where it's going to create a return and it's passive. So my focus is I'm not trying to you know build the next real estate company. Or I'm not trying to build the next product company. I'm focused on my area of expertise where I've, you know, uh, I'm working to, to master and to achieve great results for clients. I'm going to keep doing it because it works and, you know, people are benefiting from it. It's making a real impact and it's also uh, beneficial, you know, to, to the business, but at the same time, right, to create that passive income um, and kind of longer term results that doesn't require my day-to-day -day focus and, and, and time, uh, 
uh, I'm making investments into other areas. Awesome. Awesome. All right. So last, uh, last couple questions. What's a daily habit that you do to set yourself up for success? I go to the gym every morning between five and six. Nice. Um, how do you like to give back? Uh, so for me, it's, you know, advice. I, I think, um, I, I like to help people and it's even, you know, maybe you've experienced this as well, but you're walking down the street, someone asks for directions or they ask a question. If I can help that, that for me, that's the best feeling. That, that's really what drives me to do what I do. Um, and so any way that I can help someone that I can, you know, uh, try and you know, guide them in the right direction or add some value to what they're doing, uh, is for me is, is really enjoyable. Awesome. What's a favorite book? Uh, other than your own. Yeah, no, no, I, I wasn't going to mention my own there. I think there's a lot of books that are better than mine. Um, <laughs> I've, that I re, you know, refer to a lot of clients. It's called straight line leadership by Dusan Jukic. Uh, I'm, I'm sure I've helped to sell hundreds of copies of that over the years <laughs> mentioning it, uh, but there's a lot of really great books out there. Uh, that's just one that stands out. It's, it's about leadership of self, not leadership of team. And, uh, cool. and I think that's really important for everyone to, to apply. Definitely. Last question. What are your three pillars of wealth creation? Hmm. Um, wow. Great question. So I guess, yeah, the, I mean, the business would be central. Number one, that's where um, a lot of stuff comes from. Then uh, diversifying into different types of investments. And I don't know if we would consider those to be different pillars uh, because some might be stocks, some is real estate, some is um, into, you know, different startups. Uh, so I've diversified my investments that way. I think, you know, one thing that would really, I would add as a third pillar, and this is really actually the central one, it's family. Um, because wealth is not just about money, even though a lot of people think that it is and focus on that wealth is, is happiness. Wealth is freedom. Uh, and so I always say to people like, you know, really, why are you doing what you're doing? What's really driving you? Like, yeah, sure. If you're going to have more money, great. But if you're missing out on the time with your children or loved ones or, um, you know, you're not traveling, you're not doing the things that you actually ultimately, ultimately want to be doing. Like you're delaying those things, hoping that you'll be able to do them in the future. There's no guarantees. We all know people, right. Where just things end too soon and it's, and it's sad. It's unfortunate. Uh, so I've chosen to kind of live my life where, um, I want to create great memories. I want to invest into experiences, not just into material things, but, um, yeah, a big pillar of wealth would be, uh, would be family. Awesome. Awesome. Good stuff. So I, I do have one more question. How can our listeners get in touch with you? Uh, yeah, definitely. They can find me on uh, LinkedIn. Uh, okay. Just type in Michael Zapersky. Michael Zapersky will find me there. Uh, we also have a, a free 47 page consulting blueprint. For, so for anyone that's looking to get into consulting or just to grow your consulting business, uh, you can get that free 47 page uh, consulting blueprint by going to consultingsuccess.com forward slash blueprint. Perfect. Awesome. Well, Michael, I really appreciate you joining us on the show. Uh, uh, tons of great stuff. I've got a lot of notes here. Uh, I, I definitely think you gave a ton of value to our listeners. So I appreciate it. Hey, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Have a fantastic rest of the day. You too. Hey, special thanks to Michael Zapersky for joining us on the show. Appreciate him spending time with us. A couple things. Uh, took from this among many is first of all, narrow your niche. He talks about, uh, you know, make your business and in your business model simple, just narrow that niche down and you're going to be a lot more successful. A lot of us think we need to try everything. We see other companies that it seems like they're trying everything, but when you really look at it, they also have a niche. So, um, narrow your niche, make it simple. Uh, the next thing he talks about is focus, um, on communicating value. Make sure you give a lot of value to other people. It's all about providing everybody else value, value, value. You give, give, give more, way more than what you take. Uh, that's going to be extremely important. And then the last thing he talks about, which is obviously uh, definitely important, is taking action, making sure you're taking action. It's very easy to think. It's very easy to uh, do the small tasks, but take massive action. That's going to get you uh, a lot farther than, uh, you know, a lot of other people that 
you know, maybe they are taking some small action, but they're not really doing the things that they need to do to step themselves out of their comfort zone to really take massive action. So again, appreciate uh, Michael for joining us on the show, uh, spending a lot of time. Go back and listen to this episode again and take one thing away. Just take one thing. Uh, that's what I challenge you to do for every episode. We'll take one thing out and implement it as a part of your daily life. Implement it as a part of your business and make sure that you follow up and make it consistent. And if you can start doing that with the podcasts you listen to, the, the books that you read or listen to, uh, you're going to find that you're going to just have a lot more success. So that's my challenge to you is to take one thing from this episode that you want to make part of your daily life. Appreciate you listening. I am Todd Dexter. I'm signing off. Make every day a Saturday. Hey, thanks for listening to the show. A couple things before we go. Again, go on to our Facebook page, Pillars of Wealth. We'd love to have you on there. Go on to iTunes. Give us a rating and review and subscribe to the show. Also, um, you know, don't forget, reach out to me if you want any help with uh, potentially growing your business and reach out to John Styles to help you buy or sell real estate. Thanks for listening. We appreciate it. Have a fantastic the rest of the day. And as I say, make every day a Saturday. <laughs>